state to state. We got your Nittany line update. It's a football discussion with Tom and Justin. So kick back and press play. With former Penn State and NFL defensive back Justin King, I'm Tom Hannafin. This is State of State. This podcast is presented by Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your summer sports this season. Major League Baseball, golf, the NBA, and NHL playoffs, especially. All the latest stats, news, and scores are available to follow your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. Head to betonline.ag today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. State of State is presented by Bet Online. The game starts here. Are you looking for a higher potential return on your savings? Turn to our sponsor, Save. As an SEC-registered investment advisor, Save safely combines the best parts of saving and investing with its Market Savings program. Market Savings is a savings product that provides you with market returns instead of interest. The returns come from diversified investment portfolios based on your individual investment profile. The return from the investments is paid to you at the end of the selected investment term. But investing comes with risk, right? Well, with SAVE, your deposit is FDIC insured and never used for any investments. The current variable APYs are 9.07% for the one-year product and 7.9% for the five-year product. So what does this cost you? Well, SAVE only charges a fee when your investments make you money. To learn more or to sign up, visit www.joinsave.com slash state. That's joinsave.com slash state. The link to the website is in the description of this podcast. State of State invites you to join Save. Blue White Week is finally upon us. This Saturday, April 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern, live on the Big Ten Network, Penn State will have its annual Blue White Game. If you can't be there in person in State College, obviously you can watch it on the Big Ten Network. We have got a full preview for what to expect what we hope is going to happen, what we think might happen, and let's just be honest, guys. Let's not overblow this. This is a glorified scrimmage. Let's all just calm down. <laughs> all right? This is going to be fun. <laughs> um, thank you for liking, commenting, subscribing, turn on, turning on notifications. Rate us. It really helps the show. Hop on social media and follow us at State of State Pod on X, Instagram, and TikTok. Thank you all so much for supporting the show. Now, this is a year that Justin and I have been co-hosts on this. And this platform has existed for about three years now. So it's just so much fun to have. It's nice to have football again, Justin. Like, even if it is something where it's like, yeah, like, let's not get too carried away with the good and bad that happens this weekend. It's just nice to be like, it's a Saturday in State College and there's some football at Beaver Stadium. I'm excited. 100%, man. Spring game is always a pretty interesting time because, like, there's there's not really much pressure surrounding the game. So you're going out to just have a good time. Everybody stay healthy. But I just remember, like, my first spring game because I was supposed to – I was early enrollee, so I was supposed to still be in high school. It was, like, my first taste of – I can't even say playing against the guys because I was going through spring ball, mm -hmm. but it was, like, the expectations of, hey, you came to school early. Like, what have you been doing here, right? Like, your parents come up to see you. Everybody's like, hey, you went to, high, you went to college early. Like, <laughs> are you playing? And then you get out there, you make a couple of plays, and you get that first feel of being in Beaver Stadium. It's not like a Saturday afternoon in season, but it is uh, It's pretty special. It's wild because, like, on average, it's like sixty to 70,000 people will show up for this spring game pretty consistently. And it's just uh, – it should be an okay day, I think, from a weather standpoint. We're recording this Tuesday. This will come out Wednesday. But, like, I think Wednesday through Friday in State College is supposed to be a bunch of rain. So hopefully the field's in okay condition. And then Saturday, as I'm looking at it right now, low 40, high in the mid-50s, windy. So uh, this is that time of year, Justin, that as a graduate, I remember that this is the time of year where you get little glimmers of the sun and then everybody <laughs> goes out and it's like, oh my God, we can tailgate, we can go to the game. And everybody gets a sunburn and is <laughs> trying to enjoy it as best they can. But like... It's groundhogs popping out of the earth. They're like, oh, my God, there's football again. But hopefully it's an okay day. 
from from your experience and you're just kind of touching on it now when you got into this time of the year the winter workouts and then spring practices by the time the blue white game came around regardless of the year that you were there were you just ready to hit somebody like full-blown go at it or is it more like hey everybody i know you want to go nuts but calm down it's funny you say that because I was playing both sides of the ball. So I was yeah. trying to learn the offensive package that we were coming out with and the defensive package when I was going in, just different stuff that was uh, like when I would be on the different teams. Because I think I was rotating the teams on like offense and defense, how they were doing it. But I remember it was a big deal when me, Derek, uh, Jordan were coming out of spring ball. So the first scripted maybe eight to ten plays, we knew we were getting like three big shots within that first 10 plays. So it was like, there's a little butterflies before the spring game because I was like, I know the one I had a seam route where I was running like a little, a little stutter and go from the seam uh, up the sideline and got my man. I don't forget who it was. I don't know if it's Norm McCree, but I got somebody pretty good. I remember making a nice move. I was I was like, say, oh. We don't need to burn that yeah, guy. I, don't right know. <laughs> but I remember making a nice move. It was like, oh, this feels like high school. And it was like open, made the catch. It was like, oh. and at that point, all the nerves kind of went away and I think made another big play. And then Nice couple plays on defense. So I had a nice showing on that first uh, spring game. But I think there was – that the nerves were there, but it was kind of loose because I was just playing both sides of the ball. So I just – I wasn't super technically sound. I was just out there kind of playing and having fun. So that was a little bit different for, I think, my intro into college versus other players that I see now where the technique – aspect and understand understanding your assignments to the core is like will keep you off the field and i remember when i got in there it was like more so understanding the concepts and like hey this is what we want to accomplish you fill out the stuff in the middle and i was like all right, right. yeah i mean so that's what's a little bit different so it's interesting the mental side of this i think especially for this blue white game is so much more important than what we do see on the field and i know every penn state football fan is going to either be in attendance or glued to their tv looking to pick apart you know who stood out who was okay who didn't do much all that sort of stuff but at the end of the day i think we need to continue to hammer home we have three new coordinators on this team, offensive, mm -hmm. defensive, and special teams, and especially what you yourself have seen at spring practices in regards to the amount of motion, uh, pre-snap reads, et cetera, that Andy Kotelnicki is trying to put in on offense consistently this time of year. The defense is ahead of the offense. I'm not expecting anything clunky, but I'm also not expecting anything grandiose to the point that we're all just going to go, oh my God, it's the greatest offense ever. It's going to be kind of a growing process and a, some growing pains potentially. Legitimately as an evaluator and a former player and then just someone who is a fan of this team, what do you hope to see specifically from the offensive execution? Sound like a broken record, but just a clear identity, right? Like, oh, this is how we're going to approach this season. And like, it, where it's just very clear from the personnel, how we attack the game, whether it's third down calls, first down calls, just throughout, I would like the identity to be extremely clear on offense, just out, even outside of being a balanced attack, right? Like where they have a little bit of, um, yeah, I mean, identity and swag to themselves. Like, that's what I would look for just in a macro perspective and it, as you all know we here at state of state have partnered with cut the social betting platform cut is a peer-to-peer -peer betting platform that allows you to bet directly against your buddies and other fans that's right you can join the believe podcast network crew on cut today and bet directly against your favorite believe hosts on your favorite sports pop culture and political topics cut is the ultimate put your money where your mouth is platform be sure to follow at cut bet on all your social media channels and download the app via the app store or cut.com use our promo code believe penn state that's b-l-e-a-v penn state for a 10 percent welcome deposit bonus don't forget that promo code believe penn state that's b-l-e-a-v penn state cut put your money where your mouth is State of State is a proud supporter of Blue White Outfitters. Blue White Outfitters was created as a retail shop meant to highlight the confidence, competitiveness, and fearlessness of the elite athletes found throughout the history of Penn State University. Check out their Lockdown U and Lawn Boys merchandise today. All sales from Blue White Outfitters directly benefit Penn State student athletes. Visit www.bluewhiteoutfitters.com today.
And it does sound like this is going to be an offense that is predicated around running the football aggressively and in a lot of different diverse ways. So I'm curious to see how that looks. I think for me, considering the amount of footage that we saw coming out of spring practices of every offensive skill player, quarterbacks, running backs, tight ends, wide receivers, going through ball carrying drills, even at times seeing the quarterbacks really spending a lot of time running the option. I'm very curious to see what quarterback Drew Aller looks like. And, and again, it's not even a situation where I'm like, man, I need to see Drew throw it all over the yard or something like that. It's far from it. I just kind of want to see what the base package is for what he does. And then allegedly through uh, the offseason thus far, he's trimmed down. His body composition is better. Not to say that he was in bad condition, but James Franklin has said, hey, he's roughly the same weight, but he's leaner and he's moving a little bit better. So uh, I, I do have my concerns about him being consistently a part of the running game. However, I'd like to see what that base looks like this weekend because we know what Bo Perbula can be in that capacity. What do you want to see from Drew? Just a command of the offense, right? Just man having a spring underneath his belt and moving out just the next year of development, right? That year two of um, just kind of letting it loose. I mean, we saw kind of how he played against Maryland, just attacking the middle of the field, letting this stuff shine through, scrambling a little bit, making plays with his legs. Uh, that's what I would like to see. Just a pure command of the offense, not really you know, looking for ghosts or anything of that nature, but really attacking it. And even considering the amount of changes that are happening for this offense, there will be uh, things that are holdovers from years past, as James Franklin has articulated, but you're going to see what Andy Kotelnicki's offense looks like at its base level. So again, not getting too hung up on the successes and failures that do happen this weekend. Uh, offensively, however, do you need to see one particular player stand out and why? Uh, I do not need to see one particular player stand out, but I would like to see some production from the receivers. I would like to see some explosive plays. Like that's what I'd like to see some separation being created on the outside and uh, uh, some spark from from the outside receivers and the inside guys for that matter. That's what I would like to see. I think every Penn State fan feels that way. <laughs> when you said that, I'd like to see the receivers do something. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I mean. That's what you want to see in the spring game. Like I said, going into the spring game when I was there, I, that was like a thing. We were drawing up the first 10 plays to get the fans excited going into the offseason. Because if you remember when we came in as freshmen and receivers, that year previous was probably historically one of the worst offenses in Penn State history. I yeah, mean, I think rough. my visit, my visit, the score was six to two and they lost. So it's like, eh. so with that being like that injection, I just know how sometimes the Penn State fans are that ebbs and flows of like coming off of a shaky, I can't even say shaky offensive performance, but just more of the expectations not being met from a fan perspective. I want to see some excitement, man, on the offensive side of the ball, especially in the spring game. Nice, nice weather. Get some corn dogs or something out there. <laughs> I just think about every time I go to Beaver Stadium, I'm like, I want the chicken basket. That's all I The think chicken about. basket, yes. I'm with you on that. Big yeah, fan of that. It's guaranteed. Speaking of the wide receivers, it does seem like this game could set up Julian Fleming for a, a feast or famine reaction from the fans. If he has, you know, a, an awesome showing in the blue white game that it's, Oh my God, Julian Fleming's everything we thought he was going to be. And if he's MIA, people are going to freak out. <laughs> well, we just got to do you know, temporary expectations. Like he's coming in. Like, he's not going to get a hundred plays. Like he's not going to get 70. No, plays no. Or eight, right. But so we just got to make sure. I mean, just make a play or something, but that's going to happen if he doesn't do anything. Like, why do we pay him this money? Why do you? Go? But that's that's the, that comes with the that comes with the uh, territory. Uh, and speaking of the wide receivers, recently James Franklin spoke with the media. He was asked in particular about Keandre Lambert Smith. Franklin said Keandre has had a good spring, has shown some real flashes this spring, and I'm seeing them on a more consistent basis. We need him and expect him to have a big year. I'm seeing more consistency in the big plays and production. So that's encouraging, but it still sounds like the, the narrative that we've heard for a few years now around Keandre is big play potential, big production potential hasn't been realized yet. And then at the same time with Trey Wallace, battled a lot of injuries for the bulk of his career, especially in 2023. So that season wasn't what it could have been. But 
this is an opportunity for him to show what he's doing and just get out there and move around a little bit. One person I'm interested to see in particular, I'm curious what you think of this, is Malik McClain. Because I think that's somebody that we've kind of forgotten about in the past year and that he came from Florida State, big, big dude, about six foot four. And he kind of got overshadowed by the hype and potential that Dante Cephas had to transfer from Kent State. Now I believe he's off to Kansas State. So it's uh, a matter of time for Malik McLean, who has multiple years of eligibility still left. Outside of Fleming, is there a wide receiver you're looking at as like, hmm, this could be a good opportunity for him? I think McLean's a, a good receiver to bring up or highlight just from his physical stature. And you go into practice, like he does stand out. Like he's a good looking receiver. And I mean, he did flash at the beginning of the season. And he kind of tailed off. That was kind of the situation with a lot of the receivers where they were popping up week in and week out and just not having any role. True consistency. So, I mean, again, when it comes to that receiver room, obviously you want to see something from Julian Fleming. But I'm excited to see the, the, um, the group as a whole show some real production, to be completely honest. One of the things that was asked about James Franklin uh, recently was, you know, if you don't see that production or the wide receiver room step up, is the potential that you see that number two tight end featured in the offense? I I don't know if you're really going to get an answer that one way or the other, but we know what Tyler Warren's all about. Do you expect to see a revolving door of tight ends this weekend? Yeah, let me just look at the formation or just the – the construction of the offense, I think it is similar to if you look, if you think back to, um, I mean, the old Patriots style type of offense, I think a lot of coaches like that, right? We have two tight ends that can do something. The outside receivers aren't really the ideal targets, but they can hit them in timing and different spaces like that. When you have a quarterback that can deliver the ball and you have two running backs, one that's a little scat back and one that's power back that can move the, the chains. And then at that point, you can have a truly balanced offense to where you're having the defense play on their heels because you can attack them so many different ways in an efficient manner too, right? Where it's just not explosive plays where you're bombing it down the field, but it's explosive plays because it's 14 yards and you're turning it up to turn it to 28 or whatever that might look like. And I think they have that, the making of that with the offense, just from the personnel standpoint, which your number two guy, pure NFL type of tight end being um, a TJ Warren. And yeah, I think he can be the number two, one or two target for drew going into this season looking at this blue white game the difficulty is evaluating units i'm thinking about the offensive line and that there's been a lot of conversation lately about cooper cousins apparently the five-star true freshman has been every bit is advertised if not more to the point that this guy could see some playing time this season uh conversations this past week in terms of whether or not he could even start At center, it sounds like Nick Dawkins probably is leading in that direction. There is going to be a battle amongst all five positions, it sounds like, and for the offensive line, something James Franklin has talked about in the training camp. There will be battles at both tackle spots, which is, you know, a positive and worrisome all at the same time. But how difficult is it to evaluate the offensive line this time of year? It's tough when. You're not watching the film. It's hard to watch in, in, in live action. But, I mean, you can you can evaluate them, I, I guess, on the film just in terms of assignment pick, pickups and things of that nature. Uh, they're not going to see too many exotic blitzes. So it's just from the standpoint of being able to block a defender um, from a man-to-man standpoint, I think you can get evaluation from, from that, pick up the playbook, how they block. But it gets kind of tough when you don't have live bullets flying. So you'll just see more one-on-one type of matchups, but man, you have to hold their own and you just don't want to see any blown coverages or guys just let loose. It's like, Oh, that could have got our guy killed. Right. Like those type of, um, faux pas against the offensive line. You just want to see cleaned up. And that's really where I think offensive line play is very unique because you can have, I mean, you can have five guys that are average that understand the, the scheme and are on point from an intelligence standpoint. And hold up pretty well versus a whole bunch of talented guys that don't understand the scheme, pick up blitzes, and let free runners uh, appear. And it can get real bad for offenses and quarterbacks, <laughs> for that matter. So you just want to see them be in line from a, a technical and intelligent standpoint in terms of picking up the different schemes that they get from the defensive line. The good thing is that there's that veteran depth 
at the guard spots. We talked about it before. Sal Wormley, J.B. Nelson, Vega Yuane got a ton of time last season. Uh, Drew Shelton is somebody who's moved between guard and tackle is probably going to be in competition for that tackle spot. This is going to be the first opportunity for Penn State fans to see what the tackle position looks like. I hope we're all understanding what we had on film for a number of years. We had Olu Fashionu, who might be the first tackle off the board in this year's NFL draft, didn't give up a sack for two years. And Caden <laughs> Ballas, who I would not put on the same level of ability as Fashionu, but still a multi-year starter who consistently performed for Penn State. Had his highs and lows, sure, but still, your bookend tackles are gone. Does that competition worry you, or based on what you've seen and what you've heard from the talent that's in the building, are you encouraged to just see who locks it down? More encouraged to see who locks it down. I mean, I don't think there's nothing to get worried about because somebody's going to step on the field and play. So I'm just more concerned to see like who really steps up and shines through. And it sounds like Nolan Rucci has really stepped in the transfer from Wisconsin, a long history with Penn State, somebody that Penn State has recruited for a number of years. Uh, flipping to the defensive side of the ball, and you just kind of touched on it, is that you know, you're know you not going to see too many exotic packages. We know that the offense will and should look different under Andy Kotelnicki, but now it's like, hey, this is the first glimpse of what Tom Allen is going to do. So you might not see anything terribly exotic, but hopefully you do see Abdul Carter in a straight line, go after the quarterback and try and be aggressive. I'm personally curious to see what the defensive tackle position looks like. I'm, I'm not terribly worried about that. There's a lot of veteran experience in that position, but I'm just curious to see who has that flash, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like this could be a good opportunity for somebody. 100%. I think you see that defensive line play, I get, that gets me excited, right? When you see dominant defensive line play because that that's the type of – uh when that group has success, typically teams have long-term success because it can hold up a lot of different things with a strong defensive line group that can stop the run and attack the passer. I mean, and it shows that, like I said, I was impressed by that group. Just like the DBs when I went to the practice were just like the sheer athleticism. And athleticism is good when you're rushing a passer and you're doing your different stunts, but you have to have some, some grit and girth to be able to hold it down when teams like Ohio state are running up the middle. So I'd like to see again, something similar as the offense where you just talk about like a cohesive unit where they're making plays in the backfield getting penetration consistently, regardless of who's rotating. So that's both sides of the football that may mean that we'll be worried about the offensive line because if, the, if I see the defensive line looking that then it means We'll probably be concerned about the offensive line, but that's what I would like to see from the defense. <laughs> well, and and again, you you said it uh, last week or the week before, I can't remember, and it's something that's normal this time of year. The defense is consistently ahead of the offense in the spring, and I don't know exactly what to expect from what Tom Allen puts on the field, the way that you reported it. was You're going to see a lot of defensive backs. I think a lot of people are going to be curious in terms of that competition at linebacker who's really – getting more reps, but I still think there's so much competition at that position. I'm not losing sleep over, you know, how many snaps Kobe King gets, how many, how many snaps Tony Rojas gets. If anything, I expect to see a fleet of linebackers thrown out there because there's a lot of guys that you talked about. It's, it's not a question of talent. It's a question of experience. So yeah, we know what Kobe King has got. Tony Rojas got himself a lot of experience this year, but still, or this past year, but is still trying to grow into a full-time role. Overall, from what Tom Allen gets to do with this defense this weekend, looking at it from the coaching staff standpoint, what, what do you expect from him? This week? I'm interested to see the the defensive units, right? When we're talking about just rotating, like with players from a personnel standpoint that he's putting together. I mean, just to try to see how he's envisioning the different groups in terms of evaluation. Like what secondary is he putting in together? We talk about the rotation up front and the linebackers, what groups of guys are consistently playing together and who's rotating in with different groups to try to get a feel for who he likes fitting into his defense. So that's what I'd be looking for. Especially focusing on the defensive backs, which I know you love. Uh, James Franklin this week was very complimentary of the transfers at defensive back. Jalen Kimber from Florida, A.J. Harris from Georgia. Speaking about Kimber, Franklin said Kimber is poised and mature. He's excited to see him, especially this summer, because he has a lot on his plate right now. And that's the thing, especially for transfers and true freshmen this time of year. Try not to lose sleep over what they do in the blue-white game. It's a chance for them to get out there and run around. But 
I'm I'm personally pretty excited to see what Kimber can do. And then A.J. Harris is somebody that Franklin said, A.J. Harris, uh, aggressive, confident, playing well, physical corner, can play all five defensive back positions. Kimber's the one with more experience. Uh, Harris, I think, is a, a redshirt freshman, a redshirt sophomore. I forget exactly which it is, but it's limited time. Are you surprised to hear that? Uh, no, I think when he came in, I, I, I think I made mention of him possibly being like that safety nickel type of cornerback. I mean, just based on his size and just uh, his athletic traits, when you just look at his high school profile, that's kind of how he plays. It's an overall good, aggressive football player that fits into that room. So uh, I'm not surprised at all. You know, sometimes older guys that have been around the block, they get through spring and you see what happens when they get into, get into the summertime when the season's really about to start. Uh, for the record, A.J. Harris, a true sophomore, so I was in the ballpark at least, but I'm very interested to see what this safety unit does, especially because there is a position where there's so much depth. K.J. Winston, Jalen Reed, Zaki Wheatley. I, I want to see what King Mack can do. King Mack sounds like somebody, Justin, that they're very excited about. It's just not his time yet what do you think about king mac i mean let's we'll see I, I mean i didn't see him too much when i was at practice and i mean but the guys that were kind of i mean kj winston zaki wheelie and Jalen reed i think are the the clear the clear one two and threes in that safety room um it's gonna be interesting to see how he fights through in the in the in the summer but uh actually haven't heard as much about him as i did when he first got on the campus so i'm not sure that's something to look at hmm uh, he was somebody that early on was drawing comparisons to Jaquan Brisker. So not mm -hmm. to anoint somebody, but the, the the body type, the style of play, the violence with which he plays. I think that was maybe Alan Zemitis who was talking to us about that a while ago here on the show. But I'm curious to see what King Matt can do. It's more just curiosity altogether. It's like, all right, let's get a little taste of these guys. Yeah, sure. And I know it's funny. Like I was actually, I had a little DB session um, with some guys locally, DB tech, you guys check in with Justin King whenever you need something in the Pittsburgh area for some DB training. But somebody was walking around the track when I was doing training. It's like, is this guy going to be the next Brisker? And it's like in front of him, I'm like, eh, you got to pump the brakes when you compare people to Brisker. I don't think we take for granted how special he was as a player. But if there's somebody that you want to compare it to, just like on body size type, KJ is probably closer to Brisk. But Brisker was wired a little different. That's the, that, that was the general. So you got to put some respect on the Brisker name. <laughs> Brisker, I mean, I know it, the, the, the Chicago Bears have struggled, but he has continued to be a bright spot for that defense. 100%. Yeah. Love what Brisker has been all about. Okay, so for the blue-white game, there's always that one player who – shines and then you kind of never hear from him again and the name that comes to mind for me the last few years is omari evans and <laughs> every blue white game that he's played in he and drew aller connects they came in in the same freshman class he shines that's another wide receiver you know hell like i i don't have expectations for omari because it's just been so limited and and it's like there is that talent there is that ability we saw it flash for one play in that Michigan State game to close out the 2023 season, but it's pretty much he's the king of the blue-white game. <laughs> and I was like, man, I'd love to see him put it all together. It'd be so cool. Yeah, you would love to, right? I mean, because you do not want to be crowned the king of the blue-white game. So don't don't put don't put that on my man Amari, man. <laughs> the king of the blue-white game is nasty work. But uh I'm not trying no, to be mean, but let's be no, real. It, I mean, that's it's extremely real. That's what I'm just telling him. Hey, let's get let's knock that tag off. But you still want to have a good game on Saturday, right? <laughs> like, I say that and you still want to have a good showing. But I mean, when he did come into the game, like he he makes splash plays, and that's something that Makes you just question the level of consistency of when because when he does step in, he makes big plays or at least memorable plays, right? So I just like to see that consistency from him throughout the time and see if he gets his, his shot. For me, I'm now thinking about uh connecting the dots just to Marcus Hagan's uh second off season with the program as the wide receiver coach and Dion Barnes, also his second year as a defensive line coach. That first year for a position coach. What's that what's that turmoil and that adjustment process like? And then you get to the next offseason, it's kind of like a little bit calmer, and maybe you have a better handle on things. Well, it just depends, right? I think someone like Hagan's that played in the NFL, that played at a high level, is still younger and just age. Uh, those guys are able to transition into 
different players, I mean, in the different rooms extremely well because they understand that every player isn't the same, right? And like how to connect with them is the the main course that you get. So I've always heard great things about Hagens as a, as a coach, but I think that first year you just want to earn, I mean, as the players want to earn trust with the coach, the coach wants to earn the players' trust that they play at like the level that he wants them to play at and do the things that he needs them to do. And it's interesting in this day and age of football because while he's trying to formulate or formulate his room, the room's trying to kind of gel together when you think of transfer transfer portal guys and guys that haven't just been staying in a room and have that uh, camaraderie that once existed in college football. So it's more so learning the personalities of the individuals of the room, the collective of the room, and then now we have to make sure they're all situated right mentally to have some production. You mentioned the transfer portal. That that's going to open up again on Monday. <laughs> so <laughs> the blue white game is April 13th, April 15th. The transfer portal opens up again for a two week stretch. Last year, famously, infamously, I guess you could say storm duck transfers in plays in the blue white game. And then he's out within a handful of days. I think he was maybe on campus for three months and it just seemed like maybe not the right fit altogether for this program. Not a lack of ability, but just not the right fit. So far, from what you're hearing of the transfers that are in, the, the conversation you and I have had on and off air is that it's like, yeah, it sounds like everybody fits that has transferred in in this past cycle. Do you expect a, a storm duck situation? Um, I don't think you can expect a storm duck situation, but um, no, I really don't. Uh, it seems like their culture is kind of intact, but you never really know what different uh, supporters or people in the player circles suggest if they're not playing in the spring game or if they're not getting the reps that they want to see. Mm. So I don't think that's something that you can anticipate, which I think it has to give credit to these coaching staffs and what they're kind of dealing with in terms of roster management, right? Because I get frustrated when we, when we always speak about it being a business and it's like, yeah, it's a business, it's a business, but there's still like amateur rules where like there's a lot of holes in the role, rules where there's like, you know, there's byproduct or there's things that are happening from the byproduct of a rule that we just didn't anticipate, right? Where you can't build a cohesive roster. It's hard to win. And then you want to say like, oh, what's the business? We got to coaches leave, do this, but it's. Like who's it actually benefiting when you have to put together a product on the field and you, you can't plan for that. Like at least in the NFL, you can plan for when guys are going to be free agents, when there's going to be a holdout, like, you know, what's going on, even when it comes from the talent acquisition standpoint, a lot of times in NFL, like we are, they're evaluating the players that are available to come into the NFL, like in college, you're evaluating 14 year olds, 15 year olds, 16 year olds, and you're chasing offers just to stay within the the game to recruit them to get to the end and it's just a lot of fuff but we call it the business but like there's an actual business that operates with rules in place that alleviates a lot of different things if we want to talk about you know getting the right product and the protocols around the game so we can have some level of uh formation that's equitable across the board so where we can put the onus back on you know team building and putting out a product where it's like you know, the talent acquisition is at, at least fair. So that's just my thing. We think about the transfer portal because, yeah, you can win. You can, it, it, there's, there's winners and losers in every situation, but it's just, it's not incentivized to be used the correct way. And the rules aren't really put together because we're just putting band aids on everything instead of just kind of holistically yeah. looking at the situation like, all right, where is the problems? Okay, this the the players are upset, the coaches are upset. So, like, who's happy with the situation right now? Like, all right, what will make this side happy? Oh, we want some transparency. Oh, this side, we want to recruit guys here. So it's like, oh, I feel like there's a way to make that work. So I wrote about a supplemental draft in high school. If anybody wants to check out the Blue Chip Academy uh uh Substack, go ahead and read that. Seriously, check out Justin's stuff on social media because if you're if you're trying to understand the business of college football and you're a player or even if you're just a fan uh there's a lot you can take away from it for me justin i look at the transfer portal window opening up right after spring practices and that it, it feels like if you're gonna go get somebody in the portal you need a guy with multiple years of eligibility that you can get in because to get somebody in in april or you know realistically getting onto campus in may look at how challenging it was for dante cephas to even attempt 
to assimilate into the Penn State's football program. So if you've got a one and done, they, they better be the most talented one and done or the smartest one and done that ever lived. But otherwise, you really need to go get somebody that is going to come in. It's like, hey, you're you might not see the field much in 2024, but we'll we'll take a look at you. Well, I mean, that's why you need strategic targeting when it comes to like personnel and college sports. And it just it can't be based on uh, unlimited cap or unlimited salary cap based on NIL, because that's where you get those players where you talk about instant impact type of guys that come at the end of their career. And the one done like a Keon Coleman down to Florida State, because you're talking about dynamic player that you pay to get there. And that's what happens typically in free agency. And that's who I think the transfer portal should be for. For the guys, it's like, oh, I'm this good and I can make my move here and that. But like, or if you get a new coaching staff and it's just not favorable for you in that situation, like you said, you have three to four years left of eligibility. It's like, hey, I can restart my career. I can build a foundation at this school. I think that's also beneficial to uh, move. But there's just a lot of a lot of gray area where it's not necessarily beneficial to the coaches or player like some coaches right the, the rich always get richer if you have money and stuff in nil you can play the game but you know it's there, there's i think there's room for growth and improvement in the whole industry would it be safe to say that this spring portal window most of the talent the top flight talent has been picked over from the winter portal opening sure sure because i would think the guys that get into the portal after the spring have some unfavorable situation that they're dealing with at their team personally and, or professionally sure personally or professional right but like at this point for you to leave in the spring and it's like all right the writing's on the wall i gotta leave and now it's up to the teams that take them in to fully understand why this player is leaving because you can have success at another at another team just because it didn't work there i mean uh zach mcpherson is a great example a corner that's in the nfl now he was in that lockdown you secondary room and he couldn't really battle and to get on the field. I think with someone to recast or field were always balanced for like a position and spot. And it wasn't that he just Penn State wasn't that fit. He goes to Texas Tech, gets drafted, I want to say fourth, fourth or fifth round. Now he's fourth, four, third or fourth year in the NFL now. So like everybody's situation, like there's areas and moments where the transfer portal does make sense. But you just have some clarity and transparency on how that process goes. I think there's still ways. Yeah, man. Where they happen. Of course, James Franklin and Kenny Sanders always keeping their finger on the pulse in terms of recruitment in the transfer portal. But do you expect Penn State to grab somebody out of the portal here in the spring? Do you expect it? Uh, I think again, it's hard to it's hard to anticipate because right now, it's, I think they're I think they're full, and then they have their their roster of guys coming in. But if someone leaves, I mean, that's that's uh, you have to change it. So you have to always have like a ready list. I would imagine. For uh, moving forward, depending on what players decide to do, so got to stay light on your toes in this day and age of college football. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it this weekend. The Penn State Blue White game. Hop in the comments section. Get at us on social media and let us know what you're looking forward to. Who you want to see stand out? Who you are interested to see get out there maybe for the first time as a Nittany Lion, what you're expecting from both Tom Allen and Andy Kotal Nikki, the new coordinators. There's a lot of new going on this weekend. And my encouragement to everybody watching and listening to this is don't freak out. Good or bad. <laughs> just don't freak out. It's a spring game. So we'll see how it all goes. Again, uh, thank you for liking, commenting, subscribing, rating us and turning on notifications. It really helps the show. And we're looking forward to the Penn State blue-white game this Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern live on the Big Ten Network. Thank you all so much for joining us. This episode and our entire library of shows is available now on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, let us know what you think of the show on social media and check out all of our content on X, Instagram, and TikTok. Search for the handle at State of State Pod. State of State is presented by Bet Online and by Blue White Outfitters.